have opportunities and will continue to have opportunities to be in worship uh, for him. We have as our scripture is taken from the gospel of John, the youngest disciple that was called. He was about 17 years of age at the time when Jesus called him. And John's gospel uh, is something that is quite unique from the other three gospels, the other three synoptic gospels, and John gives a view of Jesus as being God with strong references. The other three synoptic gospels do present Jesus as being God, but John stands alone in emphasizing uh, scripture that was called in to his functioning of the Holy Spirit so that he could give us his unique view of Jesus as being God. And we have chosen from the lectionary scripture that you heard this morning one verse out of that chapter that we will focus on, and that comes from <coughs> verse 28 of chapter 20. And it simply reads, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And we would have as a supporting scripture that is very important to us to understand the gravity of that statement that Thomas answered unto Jesus, my Lord and my God, comes from us from 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter and the third verse. And that supporting scripture for our discussion this morning reads like this, Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus be cursed. No one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. This is Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians. And I'll read it again to let it soak in to us because it does lead to what caused or enabled Thomas to speak those words that he answered Jesus with. Paul again is writing to the Corinthians, therefore I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Thus, we have a question for us today. How do you answer? How do you answer? John Wesley stated, no one can say Jesus is Lord or can receive him as such, but by the Holy Ghost. The sum is, and these are John Wesley, the founder of what we now know as United Methodism. The sum is, none have the Holy Spirit but Christians. All Christians have the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All Christians have the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. If you have professed Christ as your personal Savior, and at the moment of your accepting him, as Savior and Lord, the Holy Spirit does something wonderful 
to us in that confession, in that moment of surrender. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. And he does something miraculously that quickens our dead spirits, whereas we have a conversion or rebirthing of that dead spirit. And we become alive in Christ. And it's a wonderful miracle that takes place within us that now the Holy Spirit comes and indwells in us to help lead us and guide us on how to become sanctified and live holy lives acceptable unto God. It is the Holy Spirit that is now with us, in us, around us, <coughs> upon us, that enables a Christian to do works for God. The Holy Spirit is by many accounts considered the third person of the triune God. He is no less God than Jesus is God. He is no less God than God the Father. Our Protestant beliefs believes in a trinity that God is three persons in one. It is difficult to get a human comprehension of what all that means. It is only by apprehension and faith that we believe that God is three persons in one. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, each having the same essence, which is omniscient, all-knowing, ever-presence, all the attributes of the Godhead, all three, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, have the essence and the attributes. However, there are specific tasks that each has, and the Holy Spirit was sent by God the Father and Son to help us in our daily lives with here on earth. And that Jesus, when he talked to his disciples, he said, I'm going, but I will not leave you comfortless. I will send the comforter. I will send the Holy Spirit. My Father and I will send. And the Holy Spirit will teach us all that we need to know. That's John, the 14th chapter, the 26th verse. The Holy Spirit will testify of us, of, of Jesus, through us. That is John, the 15th chapter, verses 26. And he will glorify Jesus. That is one of the main, three of the major functions of the Holy Spirit. He will glorify Jesus. John, the 16th chapter, the 14th verse. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. There are four associations that we have with the Holy Spirit. And the Greek words for that four essential is with us. That's para, P-A-R-A, the Greek. The Holy Spirit is with us, always with us. He was with us. He was with us. He is also have the ability to be in us. I in is our English word. E in is the Greek word for in us. In us. And certainly when we become Christian, the Holy Spirit becomes in us. The third is epi. Epi. That's a Greek word. Epi meaning upon, such as the Spirit came upon those Christians on the day of Pentecost. 
epi, of which we can hear the word epicenter, whereas from the epicenter there is of an earthquake. The epicenter is the center and it's spread out where it impacts everything around us. The fourth is pimp le me. Pimp le me, that's a Greek word that means being filled. And usually when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we can go out and boldly declare or proclaim God's word as did the disciples in Acts, the fourth chapter, the 34th, 31st verse, where they prayed for the disciples and then they began to preach God's word boldly. I looked at Brother James because he had a Bible study on the book of Acts. So we know that being filled by the Holy Spirit is essential for the proclamation of God's word. Hmm. So John's gospel, as we look at that long verse there, whereas Jesus had appeared approximately a week before on the day of resurrection, as we call it, uh, to the disciples there in a locked room. But Thomas was not there when Jesus appeared to those disciples there on resurrection night now. And you read other gospels that Jesus appeared and he said, peace be with you. And they examined him. And those disciples believed that they had seen or experienced the resurrected Lord. But Thomas was not there. Thomas was not there. When the church met, Thomas was not there. Some preachers preach on that. Thomas has been considered by many, and I think it's a misrepresentation of Thomas, as being doubting Thomas. You hear that? Doubting Thomas. But Thomas, this man Thomas, they call twin, or Didymus, which actually means twice, um, was not there. He was not there. Where was he? We don't know where he was. The Bible does not explain where he was. Perhaps he was boldly walking the streets of Jerusalem. Perhaps he was going door to door, not afraid to die, as which he indicated in the 11th chapter of the Gospel according to John when Lazarus had fallen asleep and the disciples at that time thought Jesus was saying that we were going to go there and they knew that there were opposition there and Thomas was saying well let us go there and die too because as early church theologians and history they have determined or they think that Thomas bore a striking resemblance to Christ himself so Thomas would be the one that says, I don't even look like Jesus. I know they, 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 they want to kill Jesus. So I have a heart that if it is so, then let us go and die. So perhaps Thomas was boldly at that time walking the streets of Jerusalem while the other disciples was locked up inside. We don't know that, but that's interesting to look at such a man as Thomas. So after the disciples had a meeting with Jesus, and of course, Thomas finally arrives there sometime afterwards, and they said, Thomas, we have seen Jesus. Perhaps John and Philip were saying, man, we, 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 we touched him, we ate with him. Jesus is alive again. Perhaps he looked at 
The oldest disciple at that time was Matthew. And it, is that so, Matthew? Yes, we have seen it. Peter saw him. The women have seen him. The two from Emmaus come and reported that they have seen him. But this man, Thomas, said, unless I put my hand in that nail print, unless I put my hand in his side, I won't believe. I'm not just going to go on what you're telling me. I respect you, Peter. You could have been hallucinating. I respect the women. Well, okay, they could have been just wanting this to happen. I respect you two from a male's, but unless I see it for myself, I won't believe. I, we can't be too hard on Thomas being such a skeptic, huh? Because for what it's worth, I want to experience that for myself. I don't want to just go on the words of others. I want to experience Christ for myself. It is a, if it is all possible, I want to have that feeling. I want to have that sensing. I want to see, I want to hear, I want to touch, to know that it is real. Hmm? So Thomas is not necessarily doubting. He is unbelieving that Jesus has rose from the dead, just like somebody else is telling him. So here comes a week later, in fact, eight days later from that, and Jesus appears, and now Thomas is with the disciples. And Jesus appears behind the locked doors. He says, peace be with you. And then he immediately focuses on Thomas. Thomas? Hmm. Come here. See my hands and put your finger. See my side. Put your hand there. John's gospel is building up to a crescendo. A crescendo that he has been formulating since the first chapter. That Jesus is God. A crescendo that includes seven discourses on his view on what proves Jesus to be the Son of God. And here at the climax of John's Gospel, we have on the 28th verse of that Gospel, a unbeliever by the name of Thomas, now believing that Jesus is who he said he is, whom the works said he is, whom the scriptures say he is, and he is being filled by the Holy Spirit, and he declared, he proclaimed that Jesus is my Lord and my God. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, residing now in Thomas, he becomes an unbeliever to be a believer and declares that proclamation that Jesus is my Lord and Jesus is my God. Think about that. All the gospel of John is getting us to a point that Jesus is God. And here, the most criminal, the most damning of an existence is unbelief. Here Jesus conquers death because he encounters a disciple who now becomes a believer. The only choice that we can make in this life that assures us of eternal separation from God, that is a choice of unbelief. disciple who had been with Jesus for three and a half years now have come to a point that he believes that Jesus is God and Jesus is Lord. That is the crowning moment of John's gospel. 
And it's very key for us today to note that that is who Jesus is. And if we are going to have a relationship with him, we must come to a point of belief that Jesus is God and he is Lord. There is no ways around it. You cannot buy this belief. You cannot earn this belief. You may be the best looking person in the world, but looks cannot help you on this. You may be the richest person in the world, but riches cannot. You may be the poorest person in the world. You may be poor as a church mouse. That's not going to help you. It is something that within when you totally surrender to the fact that Jesus is God and God alone and he is Lord of your life. And when you get to that point, no matter what drives you to that point, it is then that the Holy Spirit will Enable you to come to speak those words and really mean it. Oh, we can say Jesus is Lord and it is a cognizant, temporary function of mind and verbalization. Yes, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. You can say that because you've heard your parents say it. You've heard someone else say it. You turn on the radio and somebody else has said all of that. But when it really means something, when it has life in it, it is only given by God, the Holy Spirit, that will unoption you to say that and it will have power in your life. That Jesus is God and Jesus is Lord. Amen. It is only by the Holy Spirit that we can say that. It is only that because we are Christian that we have accepted Christ as our personal savior, that we can really say that and it has power, it has meaning. It is just not a verbalization of some cooped up words. Jesus is God and Jesus is God. Well, anyone can say that. There's nothing but a child of God who can say it and it has power. Amen. It has meaning, it has life. That we say like Thomas, Jesus is Lord. And Jesus is God. To admit that Jesus is Yahweh. That Jesus is Jehovah. That Jesus is the great I am. That Jesus is healer. That Jesus is Jehovah Tiskanua. God of our righteous. That Jesus is Jehovah Rapha. He is healer. That Jesus is Jehovah Jireh. He will see to it. He will provide that Jesus is God. And not only that Jesus is God, we're submitting to him as being our Lord. And we submit in spite of our agenda, in spite of our wretchedness, in spite of who we are, who we've been, who we may become, that Jesus is Lord. And we cannot do that in and of ourselves. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can declare that Jesus is God and Jesus is Lord. So how do we, like Thomas, answer? How do we answer this question, answer this proposal, answer this opportunity to tell the world or to declare for ourselves and those around us that Jesus is your God? That Jesus is your Lord. How do we do this? Now certainly we'll not end with a lot of room like the disciples, Bartholomew, Philip, and John, and James, and Philip, and Peter, and the two Judases. Well, the one Judas, the other Judas is gone. Um, how can we do that? How can we do that? The two James were there, and some other disciples were there. How can we? Declare, proclaim, witness that Jesus is God and Jesus is Lord of our life. How do we do that? How do you answer that? Hmm? 
Mm -hmm. Jesus tells us, here's how. In the 25th chapter of the gospel according to Matthew, verses 31 on to the end of the chapter, he tells us of sheep and of goat. Huh? He tells us that when he was hungry, you fed me, or you did not feed me. When he was thirsty, you gave me something to drink, or you did not give me something to drink. When I was a stranger, either you took me in, or you did not take me in. When I was naked and clothless, you either gave me clothes, or you did not give me clothes. When I was sick, you attended to me, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came to visit me, or you did not. And if you did it, or did not do it to the least of these, you have done it or did not do it unto me. Amen. So when we encounter Jesus, what is our response? How do we answer when we encounter Jesus? Do we give food to those who are hungry? Do we give that food by saying, the Lord is my God. Jesus is my Lord. Do you give that food? Do you provide for basic needs for people who need those things that are essential to life and we have an opportunity? Do we answer the question? He's my Lord and my God. Amen. These people who are strangers to us, who don't look like us, like us, who don't smell like us, who don't dress like us, who don't talk like us, who don't walk like us. Do we take those people in? Or do we have another type of attitude that says, well, Jesus ain't my Lord. Jesus ain't my God. But if we do, we declare that Jesus is God, that Jesus is Lord. When people need clothing to cover the shame that they may have of past mistakes, do we turn away from them? Or do we put clothes on their back telling them they're still accepted? And when we do, we make a declaration, we make a proclamation that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is God. Do we have an opportunity when we meet people who are sick? Sick like us. Hmm? And we have the empathy. We have the feelings for them. Because we are sick just like them. The church house is full of sick people. I'm sick. You sick. Everyone in here is sick. Everyone out there is sick. But we have an opportunity to proclaim and witness for God and tell them that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is God. Come on in and receive the healing for our sickness. Amen. When we have opportunities to visit those who are in prison, not just at New Steric or other institutions, we've got people walking around here outside of prison walls who are in prison. Do we help them unlock that which keeps them in prison, that which unlocks the chains of that are enslaving or shackling them of addiction or whatever situations that they're going in that they find difficulty in and in their lives? Do we help them break those chains? Do we help them break out of prison? By giving them what they need, by sharing them of the love of God, by declaring that Jesus is God and Jesus is Lord. Hmm? Hmm? This is a powerful statement.
that Thomas makes, that all of us as Christians must make as a declaration of our belief in Jesus. Belief that is stronger than fact, that Jesus is God, that Jesus is my Lord. And we can only do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. A Holy Spirit that is promised to be in us, to lead and guide us every day of our Christian lives. That we have access to the power of the Holy God who raised himself up on resurrection. That we can now become those powerful witnesses that tells the world that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is God, and I am here and he is mine. Just like Thomas who went from unbelief to believing, even though we have not necessarily seen just Jesus physically, by the nail prints in his hands or his side. The record has it, we are more blessed than Thomas because we don't see, but yet we believe. We're more blessed than the original disciples because we by faith Believe that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is God. We by faith can say, I can face another day because he is alive. I can be whom he has called me to be because Jesus is alive. I can withstand all of the pressures of this life. I can go through whatever I'm going through because Jesus is alive. I'm a witness that Jesus is God, that Jesus is Lord, and he's alive today. Amen. 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 And amen. Because we need every one of you and myself to tell a dying world that it's okay to be healed, but we've got to lift up the healer. It's okay to be delivered, but we've got to lift up the deliverer. It's okay to enjoy this life to lift up the life giver. In our praise, in our authentic worship, then we must proclaim that Jesus is Lord. And Jesus is God. What is your response? What is your answer? How do you answer that? Either by your own abilities or by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? amen. And amen. amen.